Thank you for joining us at Community On Demand. Today's message is presented by Dan Greer. Dan holds a doctorate from Grace School of Theology and is the senior pastor here at Community Church. This message was recorded during a live Sunday morning service at Community. Let's listen in as Dan begins. You know, every week, our local Christian radio station has a segment that they call Pray Down at High Noon. Did anybody ever heard of that one? You know, um, our Father. <laughs> they do this at 12 o'clock. And every, every weekday at 12 o'clock, uh, a past, uh, they'll have a big gong, you know, and, and pray down at high noon, and a pastor, a dignitary from the, from the area will come on, and they will quote uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, and they usually quote it in the King James Version, and I like that, you know. Um, they, uh, and, and they call that the Lord's Prayer. And, and I, think, I think it's really nice. Um, I think that this passage of Scripture would be better titled the model prayer. And you say, why would you say that? Well, um, just preceding Matthew chapter uh, 6, verses 9 to 11, the disciples came to Jesus and they just looked at him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. The Lord had been going up the mountain and he had been praying and, 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 and he just seemed to know how to do it. He said, teach us how to pray. And, and I want you to look at verse 5 in chapter 6 because this is what Jesus said as he's teaching them how to pray. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Look down at verse 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do. Skip down to verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. Do you see what he's doing here? Jesus is giving his disciples a pattern, a sample, a model prayer to use when they pray. He's not telling them to memorize this passage of Scripture and every time you pray, quote this Scripture to God. He's not saying that. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, okay? I think it's good to memorize and repeat the Lord's Prayer. If I did it today, I think 95%, maybe 99% of you guys have already memorized the model prayer. But, in fact, what we do with this model prayer in our discipleship track, we, we use it, we take it in a segment that we call learning how to pray. We take this prayer and we, we divide it into sections and we teach our disciples how to pray. And I want to do that on just a couple of lines this morning with you. Uh, the, the very first line, I call that uh, the posture of prayer. Uh, we'll, we'll continue looking at verse number 9 there. Our Father which art in heaven, I like the King James Version of this prayer. Yeah. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Do you know what it's there? When we come into the throne room of God, He is the creator of the universe. He is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He is our all in all, the Alpha and the Omega. He is everything. And when we come into His presence, we ought to come into His presence awestruck. Oh, holy, 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 almighty God. This is an amazing thing, more than anything, to come into His presence. That ought to be our posture, coming into His presence. We teach that in our discipleship track. The second part of it is the prophecy in prayer. Let's continue reading here. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The very first thing that Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray for in the model prayer is to pray for the coming of his kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you think about that? What what, what do you mean? 
What do you mean, thy kingdom come? What does your kingdom come mean? What, 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 what do you mean when you say your will be done on earth? Is your will being done on earth? I would say a very loud no. When I look around, this is not God's will. So, what, what does it look like? If you go to Revelation 20 and chapter 4, John describes the kingdom of heaven on earth in, in a time period. And six times he says there that, that it will be for 1,000 years. Now, some of you are kind of looking like, wait a minute. Does it really say that? Go and check me out. Six times John gives us that information that Christ's kingdom on earth prior to the new heaven and earth, prior to the eternity, as an inaugurating eternity, is what we would call the millennial kingdom of Christ on earth, literally headquartered in Jerusalem. You don't get that taught much today in many churches. Now, there are about three common views on the millennial kingdom. And I want to give those to you. I didn't put them in your notes. So you can you write them down if you want to, or you can catch it later. But there are, th there are three common uh, views about Christ's kingdom on earth. The, the first one is we would call post-millennialism. And, and that, that view teaches that we, the church, are building the kingdom of God on earth. Have you ever heard that? We're just building the kingdom. We're building up the kingdom. That is, uh, is, is what you hear people say. The idea of postmillennialism is, we, is, is that it's the church that's building the kingdom. And when we get finished building the kingdom, then the Christ will come. That's postmillennial. All millennialism teaches that the kingdom is spiritual in nature. And, and that there will really be no ah means not. Millennial. There will be no literal kingdom on earth. Uh, that we're spiritually living in the kingdom, and the kingdom of heaven is right now within us. And then there's premillennialism. That teaches that the kingdom of heaven is coming to earth just after the glorious return of Christ and will last for 1,000 years. And then following the millennial kingdom, there will be a new heaven and a new earth and eternity where Christ rules and reigns. We hold the last position. We hold the pre-millennial position here at Community. You know, I'm a student of eschatology. I love it. I, I love teaching it. You know, what is eschatology? Eschatology is the, uh, is the study of things to come. We might call it prophecy or the Bible predictions. And I love studying it and digging into it and finding fulfilled prophecies. And, and the more I study about the millennial kingdom, the more motivated that I become to serve the Lord and teach others about the coming kingdom of heaven on earth. I, I, I get excited about it. Knowing about the kingdom of heaven on earth, watch this. Knowing about the kingdom of heaven on earth gives me purpose in life. I have something to look forward to. It makes me excited. It gives me identity. I'm one of his. It gives me energy and motivation. And, and I just can't, I can hardly contain myself as I study about the kingdom of heaven on earth. You know, there's some of us this morning here today that uh, we're experiencing disillusionment with what we see. Some of us are experiencing discouragement, depression, out and out distress, defeat. You know why this happens? It happens when we lose sight of the soon coming of Christ and we lose our vision of what the kingdom of heaven on earth will be like. We get discouraged. We want to quit. Burn out. What's the use? Why go on any further? Well, I've got news for you this morning. 
The Bible is filled with information about the coming kingdom of heaven on earth. Isaiah and Zechariah, they teach us that it will be a time of glory. It will be a time of peace. It will be a time of joy. It will be a time of justice. It will be a time of longevity. My wrinkles will go away. I'm so excited about that during the kingdom, you know. It will be a time of righteousness that reigns on earth. Revelation 20 and, and 2 Peter teaches, that, again, that it will last for a thousand years. And it will inaugurate eternity. The book of Matthew presents Christ as the reigning king, the king of the Jews, that is coming to bring the kingdom. And is the only book in the Bible that mentions these words, the kingdom of heaven. Other books mention the kingdom of God. And we'll talk about that as we get down... Uh, through the study in, in the weeks to come. But Matthew introduces us to the kingdom of heaven with preaching, with participants, and with parables. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. I want us to dig in to this thing that Matthew calls the kingdom of heaven and see what is it all about? What will it be like as we study in his word? So first of all, he introduces the preaching. Matthew introduces the preaching about the kingdom of heaven. It starts in Matthew chapter 3, verse number 1. There it says, In those days John the Baptist came in the, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I don't think that we could quite express what was happening here, but John the Baptist, the baptizer, explodes out of nowhere on the scene of course, we, we saw his birth. I mean, we read about Elizabeth and we know about that. But then he explodes on the scene preaching this message of the coming kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The thing about this, it was specifically in the area of Judea. And what it says is that all of Judea came out to hear him preach. And respond to his preaching. Well, it didn't last very long. If, if you read your Bible, you see that he made the king mad. Got locked up. Got his head cut off. Remember that story? Yep. I, I, I watched that. I'm going to try not to make the king get mad, okay? I just like my head, you know. So, so when, when, he, when he went to prison, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus picked up the mantle and began preaching. Look in verse of Matthew 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Not only did he do that, but initially, what he did is he had his disciples to preach that same message. And I want you to read with me in Matthew chapter 10 what specifically he told his disciples. These 12, Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not Go in the way of the Gentiles, as Rich, Rich was talking about us. Do not enter a city of the Samaritans up north, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That would be Jews only. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Whoa! Whoa! Jesus told his disciples initially just to go to the Israelites and present the kingdom and offer the kingdom and preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Jews, they were living under the occupation and the oppression of the Roman government. They were looking for and expecting the Messiah to come. And the way that they saw it and envisioned it to defeat those Romans, to drive them back to Italy and set up his earthly kingdom right then and there on the earth. That's the way that they saw it. Sadly, when the Messiah appeared and began ministering on earth, what did they do? They rejected him. They crucified him. And they relinquished or lost the kingdom of heaven on earth. And it's been postponed for 2,000 years. Jesus and John and those 12 disciples initially came preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
and they rejected it. They didn't like this Messiah. It wasn't what they were thinking. So Matthew introduces the preaching about the kingdom of heaven. Then he introduces the participants of the kingdom of heaven. I want to tie these participants to this message from Matthew chapter 5 in a passage that you're very familiar with called the Beatitudes. And there are two Beatitudes in here that I want to specifically look at. One would be in in verse number 3, and it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then down in verse number 9, verse 10, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This section of Scripture, as you know, and I just said a moment ago, are called the Beatitudes, where the kingdom of heaven is mentioned twice, and where the kingdom of heaven is assigned to those who are poor in spirit, meaning humble, not proud, to the, to the humble, and to those who are persecuted for, uh, for, for the Christ's sake of the kingdom of heaven. There's no doubt, and, 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 and as we read this, there's no doubt that God can bless His people in this life with the benefits of the Beatitudes. In other words, there's no doubt that He can bless our lives with comfort and fullness and mercy and earthly inheritance and the ability to visualize or see God and godly people. <coughs> or, <coughs> excuse me. I get so excited about this stuff. <laughs> that would be like the spiritual application. Where that we are following Christ and, and get blessed. But when His kingdom comes to the earth, those who are assigned to His kingdom will literally be comforted, filled, receive mercy, inherit the earth, see God, like Rich was saying, in person, Jesus Christ, in person. They will be called the sons of God, and they will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And all the people said, Amen. Well, all the people said, Amen. Amen. (laughs) Man, that excites me. I love the way that John puts it in Revelation chapter 20 there, in uh, Revelation 24. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's for us that have been assigned to the kingdom of heaven, those that know Christ as their Savior today. He introduces preaching about the kingdom of heaven. He introduces participants about the kingdom of heaven. And then he introduces parables about the kingdom of heaven. Go all the way down to chapter 13, because this is where it really starts. And the disciples came to him and came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he being Jesus answered and said to them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not been given. A parable. What is a parable? (laughs) A parable is an illustration or a story that is used to explain, to clarify, or to amplify the meaning of something. Let me give you a couple of examples. You know exactly what I'm talking about when I tell you the story of the boy who cried wolf. Do you know what I'm talking about? How many of you know this one? The parable of the little red hen. I'm the little red hen, okay? <laughs> you know it. Three. Oh, man. We, I got I to gotta tell you. No, I don't have time to tell you this story. You, go to the internet and, and find the parable of the little red hen. Jesus said that the reason that he used parables is because people just don't understand. They can't see, they can't hear, they don't understand the secrets of the kingdom. (coughs) He's teaching them to his disciples, but the other 
But people just don't get it. They don't understand. And I think that's the case today. Most people in churches today and Christianity today do not understand what the kingdom of heaven on earth is all about. In Matthew, Jesus taught nearly a dozen, Matthew 13, actually, he taught nearly a dozen parables about the kingdom of heaven. And over the next few weeks, what we are going to do is we're going to open up those parables and we are going to talk about what the kingdom of heaven on earth will be like. We're going to kind of go through those parables. But right now, the question would be, how, do, how does the kingdom of heaven apply to us? How are we connected to it? Scripture clearly teaches that Christ will return and set up his millennial kingdom on earth prior to the beginning of eternity. So how does that impact us? You may not understand this, but there, it impacts everyone sitting in this room three dynamic ways. And we really need to understand this. Let me give you three ways that impact us. Number one. When it comes to the kingdom of heaven, some of us are going to have regrets. Um, let me take you back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19. Jesus speaking, he's talking about the prophets and the law of Moses. And he says, whoever breaks one of these least, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Again, the prior passage, Jesus has said, I've come to fulfill the prophets and the laws, not to destroy them. I, at 9.30 every Sunday morning, Rich is actually going through a series called Faith in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and and he's, he, he's opening up how, how God talks about these Bible stories of people who had dynamic faith in the Old Testament uh, and, and, and fellowship with God because of that. Um, here, he states that Bible teachers who break these commandments and, um, and teach others to do so will be the least in the kingdom. What do you mean, the least in the kingdom? Let me, let me take you to chapter, uh, to Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. And Peter kind of gives us a little bit better description here. He says, But there were also false prophets among the people, back in the Old Testament, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive Heresies. Now watch this next statement. Denying the Lord who bought them. I think he's talking about teachers who are believers who've gotten messed up on their doctrine and they're teaching false doctrine to people in the congregation. And they bring them on themselves swift destruction. Here at Community, we believe that correct Bible doctrine is paramount. And that is why we use the literal, grammatical, historical, contextual method of interpretation as opposed to the metaphorical, typolog typological, allegorical method of interpretation. You say, oh, you say there are no allegories in the Bible? I did not say that. Did you say there's no, there, there, there are no types in the Bible? I did not say that. How about metaphors? Yes, there are metaphors in the Bible. But when you pick and choose and decide that you will decide what's a metaphor or a type or an allegory, you're in trouble. Usually it clearly states that. That's why we think that it is so important that we constantly be looking and checking and are accountable for our Bible doctrine that it is correct, that it is teaching the truth. In Matthew chapter 8, there's a strange verse that I want to read to you. Here's what it says. 
But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does that mean? Sons of the kingdom. I believe what it is teaching is that there will be dark depression, weeping, and horrible regrets among believers entering the kingdom of heaven who have wasted their lives, who have disbelieved the prophecies, who have denied his commands, and, and teach others to do so. You mean, you, a moment ago, you said there's going to be peace and joy and, 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 and longevity and all those things in the kingdom of heaven, and now you're saying there's going to be regrets? Absolutely. There'll be, there will be regrets. And you say, well, how, how, how do we avoid regrets? Don't waste your life. Spend your life loving and serving the Lord. Some of us may have regrets. Some of us will have rewards, though. That's a good part. Matthew uh, 5, 19 says, But whosoever, as part of the same verse, but whosoever does and teaches them, that's commandments of the Bible, he will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Christ has commissioned us to preach and teach his word. And here he promises to reward those of us who do so when we arrive in the kingdom of heaven. And in Revelation, as, as it ends, here's what he says. And I love this statement in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. It's Jesus speaking. He says, and behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. And I give to everyone according to his work. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a part of the rewards that I'm so excited about. Can you tell I'm excited this morning? Look, look down in verse number 11. You're going to like this part too. I mean, cha chapter 8, verse 11. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. We, we just got back from camp in July, and one of the things that we do in camp is that about an hour before dinner time, well, you know, well, everybody goes and gets a shower and gets ready and some rest, but some of us, uh, Kenny and I and a, and, and a couple of others, will go and sit at a round table and we invite any of the counselors and any of the students who want to come and discuss anything about the Bible that they want to discuss. This is free time. You come and we discuss. That, you know, it starts out really small at, at the beginning of camp, but man, we're pulling chairs around the table by, at the end of the camp because there are questions that people have around the Bible, and I really... Depend on Kenny to answer all those questions, you know. <laughs> and he does. Well, I stumble. You know, he'll, he'll pick it right up. And uh, I say, that's exactly right. You, you, it's exactly right. Did you get this passage of Scripture? In the kingdom of heaven, in the millennial kingdom, we're going to get to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and I've already got my questions all lined out. Abraham, I cannot hardly... Over in, in the book of Genesis, when you were up against those five kings, you're like, I only have 300 people. Can you tell me how you did that? 300 against five kings. It's amazing. But we'll also have access to Jesus. We'll be able to go in and sit down with him. When we arrive... At the kingdom of heaven on earth, some of us are going to be pleasantly surprised. Whoa, I didn't realize that. Do you know you get, you know, there's a crown for those of us that get up in the morning and say, Lord, I know I've got to go to work today. Could you just come before 8 o'clock? You know, <laughs> that we're looking for the Lord to come. When we arrive, some of us are going to be pleasantly surprised. There are going to be rewards crowns, positions of authorities, close access to the Lord and to the patriarchs in the Bible. You want to talk to Gideon? That will be the time. 
Some of us may have regrets. Some of us will have rewards. But all of us will have a review. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us may receive the things done in the flesh according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You may or may not know that the Bible teaches there will be two judgment seats. There will be the judgment seat of Christ. What we, this is what we just read about here. And then there will be the great white throne judgment over uh, in Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15 where all the unsaved are judged for their works. Saved judge, Bema seat judgment, that judgment seat of Christ is translated Bema, judgment, a judgment of rewards or losses, great white throne judgment, a judgment of works for salvation which do not work. The Bema judgment will determine our rewards or our losses according to our works as believers. And the passage that we have for that is 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 12 through 14. Now if everyone builds on his foundation with silver, I mean with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, That doesn't say stubble, that says straw, unless you're reading the King James. Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If any one's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. At the beam of judgment, we as believers will come before the Lord and our works will be judged. Are they superficial? Why did we do what we wanted to do? For vain glory? For a pat on the back? Or did we do it because there was a need? There was a heartache? Did we do it because we love the Lord? What was our motive? Were we faithful? So they say, You've been faithful over a few things, enter in, and I'll make you rule over many things. Oh, have you been unfaithful? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. What would it be? You see, the thing is, is that some of us may receive, may have regrets, some may have rewards, all will have a review. And as believers, we all appear before the beam of judgment seat. The judgment seat of Christ <coughs> for rewards. <clears throat> I, I, I reread a story this week. I may have told you this story. So if, you've, if I've done this, please forgive me. I'm getting old, okay? And I can't remember when I told a story or not. But I read a story this week about a world-class runner that was invited to run in a marathon up in Connecticut. She lived in New York. It was up in Connecticut, and she was invited. She's pretty excited to go because there was a big uh, uh, cash reward for whoever won. And so uh, she, on the morning of the race, she got up um, and started driving from New York over to Connecticut. By the way, I let Dr. Anderson drive us through Connecticut one time, and he did not know where he was going. He got us lost out there. (laughs) It was a beautiful drive. But she's driving through Connecticut, and she gets lost. She got lost. She was on Dr. Dave's tours. She got lost. (laughs) And she pulled up to a gas station, and she said, I've been invited to run in this marathon, but I I can't find it. All I know (coughs) about this marathon is that it starts in a mall parking lot. And and the attendant of the station said, well, there is one just right up the road about a mile on this road that starts in a a mall parking lot. If you hurry, you you can make it. Well, she got in the car, and sure enough, she pulled up, and she was really 
pleasantly surprised that it hadn't started. People were still building around, but the runners were kind of getting in, in position to start. And she went over to the registration desk, and the people were just delighted that she showed up, that such a runner of, of renown was there, and, but they couldn't find her registration. And they started looking through the registration, and they said, oh, forget it. They filled something out, gave her a number, and put it on her. And she went over to the, to the uh, starting line and started and ran with ease. And it was a cool day, and, and uh, uh, she got ahead of the pack. And she won the marathon, beating the second runner, who was a guy, by four minutes. And uh, it wasn't until she went back to the registration desk, and they did not have that envelope full of money to hand her for winning the race, that she discovered that she had been running in the wrong race. The right race was still about five miles up the road, and she ran in the wrong race. Didn't get a reward. Do you sometimes feel like you're running in the wrong race? Do you, do you feel like you're running in the rat race instead of the right race? I do. When you and I stand before the Lord for our review, the question is, will there be rewards for running the right race? Or will there be regrets for wasting our lives on things that do not matter? As my pastor used to say, it won't be worth a hill of beans. I think a hill of beans is a lot, a lot, worse, a lot more than they were back then, but will be... Not much. You say, well, what do we do? Well, this is a good time for a commercial because next Sunday at 5 o'clock, we are having a ministry rally. We have people in our church that have selflessly worked in the nursery. And you know what that means, okay? We've got workers out there right now teaching our kids so that we can not be disturbed. We have, we have singers that come up here every week. They practice during the week. And they come up early in the morning while you guys are still cutting Z's, you know. They're down here practicing. We, we, we've, got, we've got people, a, a, a great number of people uh, that serve the Lord to make this ministry go. And one of the things that we want to do is we want to recognize them. We have a free complimentary barbecue dinner next week. You don't have to go, you don't have to pay a dime for it. It's already paid for. Brisket, sausage, potatoes, banana pudding. Oh. And, and, and we're going to introduce our ministries. We're going to introduce people that, that, that work in our ministries. Now, we're going to we're going to relaunch some of our small groups. We may start some new small groups. We're going to uh, recruit for our ministries. Uh, we're getting ready, folks. Uh, by the end of this year, we'll be transitioning to this building over here, uh, this youth building, and we've got to load up on volunteers. You say, man, I don't know if I've got time. That's not what you'll say at the judgment seat of Christ. You'll say, man, I wish I'd have taken up the cause. Folks, in Ephesians, Paul tells us to be redeeming the time because the days are evil. Would you agree the days are evil? What does redeeming the time mean? It means buying it up. How do you buy it up? You go all in. It's time to redeem the time because the days are evil. Like Jesus and John preached, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's coming. And we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There will be reviews, rewards, regrets. Let's redeem the time by getting on the right race and running with endurance. Let us do that. On behalf of Pastor Dan and the folks at Community, thank you for joining us today at Community On Demand. Feel free to share this link with others, and please know you are always welcome to be our guest.
during a live service any Sunday morning at our campus in the Woodlands, Texas. For more information, just click on the link www.cbcwoodlands.org. I hope you will again join us at Community On Demand.